if you look at it in a general sense, when I when I've spoken with people and they've said I've tried something, their inclination is to go to something that's going to slow a person down, like a delayed auditory feedback or a pacing board or like tapping out the syllables. And I think those things are fine in the short term. Um, it's just, uh, I think, um, they need to understand the intricacies of cluttering a little more and also like, okay, so I can tell someone to slow down, but what if that doesn't completely work? And what if that makes them sound unnatural? And, you know, is there, like, I like to focus on a more natural way to do that than with devices and things that they can't maintain or that may make, I don't know, them sound or feel atypical. My style is more pragmatic and it's more low tech um, in terms of that. And I don't think people always go to that. They go more to the devices and the pacing, but then they don't necessarily know how to bridge it. I'm talking about people who have less experience and would just intuitively go to that. They don't know how to bridge it to real life you know, so yeah. that's probably the gap. That's why, you know, my method is, like I said, very pragmatic. And if you're talking about someone with just, as we, as we said, not a language disorder, but maybe more in language planning, you know, what do people who clutter not do enough? I know it was in the book, about you as well, you know, they don't pause enough. They don't pause long enough. And even when you teach them to pause, um, and when I say they, it's really a generalization. We know everyone's different, right? But mm -hmm. a lot of my um, clients, you know, you teach them to pause and they're like, I am pausing. And you're like, I, I say, okay, but I can't perceive that pause. So that pause, you perceive it, but I can't perceive it. So I do more of a natural, like, let's put pauses in natural places. Um, let's look at the listener for their feedback proactively, um, all those things that we do in communication. And even for some of my more resistant teens, I just talk about how everyone has times when communication breaks down. Now, this is not like to say, um, you know, I don't like when people say, oh, everyone stutters. No, <laughs> everyone doesn't stutter and everyone doesn't clutter. But I'll say everyone has times where communication breaks down, where someone's not loud enough, where someone's not clear enough, your words don't come out the way you, you know, expect them to. How does that get repaired in a natural way? But then I'll still say, you know, we're talking about cluttering. This happens to you much more than your average speaker, you know. So not to say that this happens to everyone, but the happens to everyone part is just because I feel like if you can understand what normally goes on in an interaction with communication breakdown, it's easier for your brain to know, well, these are the things that would naturally happen to repair that. And I've had a couple adult clients in the last couple of years. One was in his 60s, he first learned about cluttering, um, one in his 40s. And they both looked at me when I talked about the pausing, like, I really don't think you can help. Like, really, really, you think you can help me? I'm too old. Not, they weren't skeptical of me. They were skeptical, I think, this is the way I took it. They yeah. were skeptical of that they were too old for the process. And when I taught them things like pausing and emphasizing their sounds in a natural way, both of them said independently, it's a, astounding to me how something so simple can make such a big difference. Um, the pausing is one thing, of course, then I've had people who they put in pauses, but then they go really fast in between the pauses, right? So <laughs> then we have to talk about, you know, more, um, emphasizing your sounds and syllables. And so, um, as I said, I think you talked about like, like do using some more of the technical technology like Pratt and things like that, which are great, I think. Um, but for my clients, I've just had them more visualize a number line, like you need to emphasize your sounds 
you know, and I talk about a zero is there's no emphasis in your sounds whatsoever. It's very, very unclear. A 10 is very unnatural sounding and a five is where we want to be, but a seven is where we practice so that you exaggerate it now because in real life, you're probably going to dial back. So that's another thing that mm -hmm. I have people focus on. And if they are having even more trouble with like some of the things that you mentioned where how do I pick the important information? Then we might work on just picking out the relevant information. Like what's most important to my lister? What's the headline? I had one client who the first time he told me a story about something, it took him 32 minutes. Wow. And then I said to him, let me just see if I can repeat back what your your story is. I want to make sure I understand it. And I think I did it in about two minutes. And he said, how did you do that? Well, now he does the same thing in under two minutes. But yeah, we had to do a lot of work to try to get to what is the main thing that I want to say versus all the details I feel I have to get in there. We did a lot of like using um, visual organizers. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but like they can be in any way a graphic organizer, right? But I do more things with like a circle, a big circle. And then, you know, I've done this with kids too. If they need to summarize a story, there's a big circle and there's four circles inside it. And the big circle maybe is the title of the story and the four circles inside it are the characters, the setting, the main events in the um, story and the, um, you know, the solutions or the outcomes. And so I talk with, you know, even when I work with adults, I talk with them about how that same setup is how we tell a story to people about, okay, well, this happened at work. We don't say the characters are my supervisor and my colleague, you know, but we say, you know, Joe and Sally were there and we were in the conference room and this was the problem we were having and these were the outcomes. So I have them try to think about that structure to pick out what's most relevant. Those, you know, I always talk about it as proactive strategies and reactive. So proactive, going into a situation knowing that you have a work presentation or you have a class presentation or you have something very important you want to discuss with your parents and you want things to come through clearly, you go in with the mindset of the pausing. But I have something that my one client and I always say, pauses make things quicker. Like how it's ironic in that way. So the same kind of a way. Exactly. Um, but the the whole idea of going into something proactively and thinking about using pauses or whatever it is that works for you because some clients i found if they pause their words are clear and that's their main thing some clients i found if they focus on emphasizing their sounds it also helps them slow down but that's all they have to think about just the one thing um, so whatever is most helpful for them, thinking about that proactively. And then also thinking about reactively, like always looking at your listener for feedback. So when they're always trying to detect that look on their face as soon as possible and being reactive to that. So knowing that, okay, wait, I'm seeing something's going on here. And then I also think, people have to you know like my clients i always train them to n understand themselves right so what are the things that happen to me the most what are the things that help me the most so then once you start to see that look and you start to know oh i tend to not put in many pauses maybe i'm not really pausing maybe i need to focus on that or I see that look and I know that emphasizing my words helps me. So maybe that's what I need to focus on. So a lot about under starting to explore and understand what helps me be clearer and then using that. I see how it can help. 
it's just, I always find that it's a, sometimes I find people have a hard time transitioning between that and then doing it in a more natural way. So to me, if you pause, if you emphasize, then I'm not really sure if you have to tap out your syllables, yeah. you know, but I'm not, but there is more than one way to, you know, get to the core of a problem too. So if it works for someone and they're happy doing it, I don't see a problem with it. Um, yeah, thank you for asking that question. That has been kind of a thing for me. You with your work and all of our other people who clutter who are getting out there like Joe and putting the videos out are really getting the word out about the myth. There used to be a myth that people who clutter were just oblivious, right? Like you didn't understand that you didn't come across well to people and you didn't really care either. And um, I don't know if you ever had any interaction with or knew, but I did see it was cited in your book, um, Peter Kisigislas. And just to kind of give you an illustration, he was the first adult who clutter I had met, I think, I'm I think so, as a doctoral student. I had contacted him prior and said, and emailed him, knew he was coming to the conference and I wanted to gather the experiences of people who clutter. So I had contacted him and a few others who I knew who were attending. And we are on this bus, on this windy hilly from the airport to the conference center. And he's in the back of the, it was, I was actually a small van. He was in the back of there and I just went and introduced myself. And he so much wanted to tell his story that he said, okay, are we starting? <laughs> like and I, so I <laughs> put down my tape recorder of my microphone like he so wanted to tell me all of the negative experiences he'd had because of his cluttering and it affected his work and it affected how his um you know how his father responded to him and you know and sadly he passed but before he passed he sent me an email and said use everything um, you know, you have about me to share with people because I want people to understand the impact of cluttering. And now, yeah, that's what my clients are saying. It's affecting work. It's affecting things like interviews. Um, it's also affecting social. Sometimes they're afraid to tell a story or they think people don't listen to them. Um, and then sometimes they're saying they avoid things like people who stutter, but for for different reasons than people who stutter, but there's still that impact. That's a good question. No, I, I definitely have found in my clinical work that most of the clients I've worked with have had predominantly one pattern um, or another, but then, you know, some have had um, what in, in that terminology would be called the phonological cluttering, having more of the over articulation and hardly any of the syntactic component. And then, you know, the same, I've had clients who have mostly the um, syntactic component and not so much the phonological. But I think probably the majority of the people I have seen have, if they have one predominantly, there's still maybe, again, that 2% of the other characteristic as well. And I can give you, so two clear examples, one a teen who he had nothing as far as I could see, but the over articulation. And it was very interesting. He was ready for discharge, very, very smart, very like, uh, you know, top of his class and um, his parents very well educated. And right before um, he was ready for discharge, his mother said to me, do you work on writing? And I said, well, we do, why? And she didn't mean handwriting. She meant like the organization of writing. And she said, well, we've just been reading his writing lately and it's very good, but it's not organized in the way that we would think. And I chatted with him about it and he said, yes, when it comes out, it doesn't come out 
in an organized way. He said, I can easily rearrange it and organize it, but it doesn't come out that way. That had never shown up in his speech, but it makes me wonder, was there a high, high level planning problem that just never came out before? So like I would say he's 99% phonologic, but maybe there is, you know, 1% syntactic component. But I think if he never had to do that high level writing, you know, someone who's an attorney having to write that, you know, brief might have to do something different than if you're writing just a memo or something, you know, yeah. no judgment on that. It's just a different language task. And I think that's why they were seeing it. Okay. And if he never had that happen, I don't know if they would have seen it. And then the other example is a gentleman um, who I work with, and he is, um, I would say, syntactic. I don't really see the phonologic um, piece, but he tells me he has it. So of course I believe him. And I will say one time we were on a session virtual like this, and he had to take a phone call and he wanted me to just wait, not hang up or, and I heard it. So, you know, it's, it, but it depends on the situation. So I would say he's probably 98% syntactic, but there's that 2% phonologic. So I don't know if I've ever seen anyone who hasn't had both, but they're, they do tend to lean more one way or another. So I, I, I think the general advice, if you can work with someone who has expertise in cluttering, just to help guide you and give you feedback, like the feedback you'd been given, you know, that's probably the best starting point because then if there's things that you're not aware of about yourself, someone else helps, you know, enlighten you to that. But then beyond that, or if that's not available, just really doing more to, to try to experiment and see what does really help me. What, and maybe talking to people you trust about what's making me clearer to you and unclear to you so that you can then make the adjustments that are needed. Well, the, the hardest thing, you know, and even among therapists too, is they, I keep trying to like get them to understand you don't have to see cluttering all the time for someone to clutter. So they'll have someone come for an evaluation, suspected cluttering, and they'll say, but I, I didn't hear anything. But, but yet they understand, you know, years ago, people didn't understand this, but they understand it now. I said, but if that person stuttered and they didn't stutter with you, does that mean they don't stutter if they're reporting stuttering outside of the clinic? And they say, no, it's, it's the same with cluttering. Like I feel that many people, especially students, they feel like as soon as the person opens their mouth, you're gonna hear it right away. For the ones I've seen, it's been a variety of things. Um, it's been a lot of times work. Um, I'm trying to think like some trying to seek a promotion. Um, some like one, it was more socially motivated, just really got tired of people not understanding his speech. Um, sometimes I think it's someone in their family kind of encouraging them you know, to pursue it. But yeah. I think everyone that I've seen, none of the adults have been like, oh, I'm only here because, you know, my wife, you know, told me I should be or my boss. They, they really do want to make a change too. They recognize. Um, with children, I think you're, you're often, depending on the timing of when they come in, you're often dealing with the the idea that there is nothing wrong with my speech. <laughs> what is wrong with the listener, right? Yeah. That's why I tried to normalize the communication breakdown for them to say, everyone has this, you know, is it annoying for you? Like what's the 
what's the motivator that's going to help you work on your speech? Because it's hard to have to monitor your speech all the time. That's exhausting for an adult. A child doesn't want to do that. So what is going to be their internal motivator? And for children, sometimes it's, um, you know, things like, does your mother ask you to repeat yourself? Yes, and it's very annoying. Okay, well, we're going to work on something so that you, your mother doesn't ask you to repeat. So what are you going to do so that then your mother doesn't annoy you or your teacher doesn't annoy you or whatever? That's different than the adult who's usually coming because, you know, they want to make a change.